Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we Endure When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have, had, you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to see you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask that your Holy Spirit would implant this word in our hearts, in our minds, change and transform us, grant fruit from it. And so as we uh, heard in Sunday school, your word does not return void, but accomplishes your purposes. And we pray that we would be changed and transformed, renewed uh, after the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, every once in a while, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you get the same email. African Prince wants to transfer his vast wealth to America. And he is happy to give you a share in that money if you would but just give him your bank account number which we all know to be a scam, kind of like the email that went out from me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those things are just all in our society. But sadly, when there was a poll about how to get rich in America today, do you know what the top two ways to get rich in America are in America in the 21st century? Number one, win the lottery. Number two, Sue somebody. <laughs> Hard work wasn't even on the list. It's a sadness. It's just a part of the way people think and um, how they think that they can move ahead financially, uh, culturally, fiscally, all those types of things. And I would say that American culture today is very much like the Corinthian culture of days gone by. Of course, in our context today, Paul is writing to this church that he planted. He's writing from Ephesus. He's heard uh, these reports about division in the church. It's based on their immaturity. It's based on the fact that they have not moved ahead in their gospel understanding. They've not progressed 
in uh, the fruit of that spirit. And so Paul is addressing uh, their, uh, their lack of maturity, their waywardness, the, the spirit of the age that is within that church. And he continues on here in chapter 4. Uh, so first we're going to look at the Corinthian self-perception, what they think about themselves. If, they, if there was a mirror, uh, this is what they would say of themselves. Uh, verse 8 it says, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And with that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. Immaturity. What does immaturity look like? Now, if you've been to the grocery store or to the Walmart, maybe late at night when there's uh, people with their kids uh, to the mall, uh, this happens, sometimes you see children throwing a tantrum. They didn't get their way. They didn't get the box of cereal that they wanted. Now they're kicking and they're screaming. Other times, immaturity looks like laying blame on others for circumstances that they did not want or that was beyond their control. Sometimes young people going bonkers when their favorite team loses. I'm sure there was a lot of that at NC State last night as they lost to Purdue. Frustration, immaturity, outbursts of anger, cursing, all those types of things. Here though, here though, as Paul writes to the Corinthian church, it looks like contentment. It looks like affluence. It looks like abundance. It looks like superiority complex. Like a country club gathering in which the attendees drink their Earl Grey tea with their pinky in the air and saying the word darling a lot. <laughs> Paul begins to address this church and he does so with some irony. I would say, sarcasm, I would say. Uh, so he starts off and he says, already you're full. Already you're satisfied. Already you have all you want. As if the Corinthian spiritual belly cannot handle anything else, they've already arrived. They've already been at the buffet of the Lord and now they've eaten their fill and they just are sitting back, resting, waiting for their nap to come. Already they have become rich. Already they have become wealthy. Already they have blessing beyond measure. Not just riches financially or fiscally, he's talking about rich spiritually. They have become rich in the Holy Spirit, so to speak. They have every spiritual gift, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms has been given to them, and now they are lacking nothing or so they think. They have no need of anyone else. They have no need of other churches. They have no need of the apostles anymore. They have no need of anybody coming in and trying to lord or reign over them. In fact, Paul says you are already reigning. You're already kings. You're sitting on the throne. You're ruling and reigning already. And Paul says, I wish it was so. I wish it was so. Because if you were truly reigning, then we would be reigning with you in the kingdom of heaven. Paul is beginning to just, you know, twist down on the Corinthians to say, you have now run ahead of the Lord Jesus in your heart, your mind, and your life and your spirit. It's, in, it's, it's as if you don't need 
Jesus Christ himself. You don't need Jesus' church. You don't need Jesus' ministers. You don't need Jesus' stewards or servants because you are so fat and happy unto yourselves. It's because of your pride. It is because of your immaturity. The Corinthians feel invincible. They feel strong. They feel wise. They feel like they're flourishing and powerful, like they're on top of the world. And yet they're ignorant of gospel truth. They are babes in Christ. I want you to begin to think about that very picture. I want you to think about the American church. I want you to think about American Christianity. Immaturity often looks like contentment and affluence and pride and vanity. And so Paul then, he just lays it out there for his uh, children in the Lord and he begins to give them a comparison between themselves, their self-perception, and the apostles. Look at verses 9 and 10. He says, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are (laughs) fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ." We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Paul brings out some military conquering ideas and illustrations here, basically in antiquity and in ancient times. If a a, a military army went out in conquest and was victorious, over another peoples, they would gather up those foreign conquered peoples and march them back to the city-state. Let's say they would march them back to Rome. And the victorious generals would go in and the crowds would be there. There would be a giant parade. Everyone would be cheering. There's, you know, uh, they didn't have it met ticker tape and uh, balloons and uh, horns and just, uh, just a wonderful festive time. And then they would march all of those conquered people through the city to be mocked and jeered and laughed at and potentially spit on and have things thrown at them. And Paul is saying that though the Corinthian church thinks they're high and mighty and superior and affluent, as if they're standing and the parade and they're cheering the victory, Paul is saying that may be you, but we apostles, we stewards, we servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the ones that look like we have been conquered. We're last in line. We are heading to the Colosseum. We're heading to the arena. It's not as if we're waiting to be condemned. It's not as if we're waiting to see if we're going to be thrown to the wild beasts or have to fight for our lives in the Colosseum. No, we're already considered dead. The death sentence has already been pronounced upon us, and we are marching to our final end. The world mocks and shames us. The world taunts us and they delight in our death sentence. But you, Corinthian church, seem to be spared from the mockery of the world and the attack of the devil and those who belong to him. Why might that be? Paul contrasts the boasts of the Corinthians to the reality of the apostles. They had been boasting, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and yet the Corinthians had moved past them. They had exalted themselves far above those they claimed as their leaders. Their leaders are suffering in this present world for the sake of Christ. 
And maybe the Corinthians are not because they don't know Jesus at all. The Corinthians are boasting of their status, of their position, their place in society, while the apostles are suffering terribly at the hands of men for their faithfulness to the gospel, for holding Christ and him crucified. They're willing to be held as fools among the, uh, in the realm of men, but they desire to be faithful to the Lord. Look at how Paul describes this. The apostles, they're the fools. The Corinthians, they're the wise ones. I want you to begin to think about that. The Corinthians are trying to hold on to Paul, hold on to uh, Cephas, hold on to Apollos. And those three men are saying, I am a fool for Jesus Christ in the eyes of the world. We're weak. We have no power in and of ourselves. Our power rests in the Holy Spirit, in the preached word, in the, in the uh, rule and reign of Jesus from the right hand of the Father who will subjugate all powers and authorities under his feet. And the apostles are held in disrepute as well. <clears throat> Foolish, meaningless have nothing to say, as Paul was called a bird, a, a seed picker when he was in Athens, just picking things up and speaking things about the resurrection. Why is it that the apostles are viewed one way and the Corinthians are viewed another? What gives? I think a question that comes to my mind is, what does authentic Christianity look like in the world, to the world? I think in its most basic form, it will bear the marks of Jesus Christ. That as the world looks at a Christian and looks at the church, they should see a picture of, of Jesus Christ in some form or fashion. And therefore, what is the apostolic reality is they go forth and preach the gospel and live among people, indigenous people who have other languages. What is it that their lives look like? Look, the, uh, the Corinthians had a crown in verse 8, and now the apostles in verses 11 through 13 bear a cross, 11 through 13. To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled we bless, when persecuted we endure, when slandered we entreat, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Living an authentic Christian life is displayed for us here. We have in the Corinthians in verse 8, we have a, a, a puffed up self-perception, an ego in which there is a lot of worldliness and there seems to be no opposition and no trial and tribulation whatsoever. It's just going along with the flow, floating down the river of the world, walking along the wide path that leads to destruction. But if you are on that path, that narrow road that Jesus Christ has set us on by his spirit, there will be all types of difficulty. The world loves the world. The world hates Christ and Christ's people. And therefore, those who belong to Jesus will suffer and go through trial and tribulation as sure as Jesus did as well. But listen to how the apostles handle their difficulties. Verse 12b to 13, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world and the refuse of all things. Repaying 
evil with good. Enduring hardship. Praying things like, Lord, have mercy on them. They don't know what they're doing. Offering a kind word when being accused or misrepresented or slandered. That's what that word is talking about there, when, we're, when slandered. It means that somebody has made up a straw man of you, your faith, Christianity, and even Jesus, and they spin this tale of falsehood or half-truths or mockery or whatever it is to make fun of you or your faith or even of Christ. It can happen on social media. It can happen in the news. It can happen at your work. It can happen in your family. And Paul is saying when those things occur, we don't visit that same type of thinking or speaking or acting or belief system back on them. We actually, we actually bless them. We, we, we fight their lies with truth. We fight their hatred with love. The scum of the earth, the refuse of all things. This was a very interesting uh, picture that Paul writes here. It's a picture uh, in, uh, we all know what this is. Maybe you've just accomplished this in your own home or you're getting ready to. Uh, spring cleaning, right? Over the course of the winter, we've had the windows closed. We've had the doors shut. And then when it gets warm and the sun's out, it's like you begin to see, oh my goodness, there is dust everywhere. There's dust on the counters. There's uh, dust bunnies underneath the furniture and underneath the table and you get your Swiffer out or you get your broom or you get your vacuum or whatever and you just do this huge house cleaning. Sometimes Susie's even known to like get a bucket and she'll just wipe the walls down. You know, just thorough cleaning. Just really get out all the dirt so everything's spick and span for the summer. Paul is saying in this verse that the apostles and the gospel preachers and the servants and stewards of the things of God are just like, in the eyes of the world, all that muckety dirt and dust. And if you've ever in your kitchen taken a rag, wet it with water, and start wiping your walls and then put that rag back in the bucket and wring it out, you've got oil and stuff that you've cooked on the walls. It's sticky, it's nasty, it's dirty. And Paul is saying that the world thinks of Christ and the people of God and the apostles just like that kind of refuse and scum. And they would like to take the trash out. Christ to the ears of a Deaf and blind world is an irritant. Gospel preachers preaching the word and the law of God against sinners is foolishness and a bother. And yet Paul is saying this is what we do. And as you preach the gospel and you remain faithful to Christ and you live out a godly life, the world will turn on you as well. So I'm so glad that you're so wise <laughs> and you're already full and that you're rich beyond measure, but I have a feeling that you're not. So now he's going to turn a little bit. He, he has, he's going to bring this out, his fatherly concern, 14 to 19, follow along. He, he's used all this sarcasm, all this irony, and now he returns to his heart for this people. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. 
That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. Paul loves this church. He loves these people. And in the previous verses, he has used, uh, you know, literary skill to help point out as clearly as possible that they have gone so far astray as to just basically feel like they're self-sufficient and in need of nothing and no one. But Paul is not interested in shaming them. I want you to think about that. As the word of God speaks to your life, to your heart, to your mind, God is not interested in shaming you in Christ. He is interested in waking us up with his word, with his uh, commands, with his principles and precepts, but not shamefully. He's wanting to wake up, <laughs> wake up, and to encourage us to live godly lives in response to the gospel message. Not shaking a finger unless it's necessary. <laughs> Because he loves us too much. Paul loved this church too much to just uh, gloss over their pride and rebellion and their immaturity. They should have grown, grown way past where they are. And so like a loving father who has uh, been away maybe, uh, maybe for a year overseas doing business or at war and he comes back and he finds his children misbehaving he loves them but if they're unruly children then he will discipline them it is the same way with the lord out of love does he speak to us when we are wayward and misled and paul paul calls them not just children but my beloved children the children that i love the children that i care about i don't want any of them to go missing or to come under heartache or hardship, or to be lost to the world. And so he comes in and speaks the truth. And so he offers uh, three, three types of things here. He, he, he engages them as a father and some family counsel. The first thing he says is, I urge you, I plead with you, I entreat you, imitate me. Paul, as their as their father in the faith is holding out his example to be compared with the rulers and the pastors and the elders of the Corinthian church who are allowing or leading the church astray, allowing or leading the church into worldliness and folly and allowing them to remain immature in their faith, allowing them to... Uh, um, uh, just flop in the gospel rather than drink it in and be uh, nourished and fortified and strengthened by it. And so he lays himself out there. Imitate me. I have modeled Jesus Christ for you in all ways. If you need a role model, you can, you can base your life on me. He will clarify that in 1 Corinthians 11 where he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So he's not saying he's Jesus. He's saying, you know, I'm a sinner too, as we know in Romans 7. But he's saying, I have laid out an example for you to follow in my speech, in my behavior, in my ministry, in my preaching, in my lifestyle. Um, I am sold out for Christ, and this is what it looks like to be that way. The next thing he does, that was number one in his fatherly advice and counsel, imitate me. Uh, he reminds them about their big brother that he sent them 
Or in the text, it's really hard. Did he send him yet? Did he not? Is he going to? I don't know. But he says, I tell you what, I'm going to send you Timothy, or I've sent you Timothy. He is, he is letting another godly person come alongside them, teach them, instruct them, remind them of the gospel message, remind them of Paul's demeanor uh, and lifestyle while he lived among them. But he's going he's gonna to send uh, a reputable representative of the Lord Jesus Christ to Corinth. Uh, kind of like uh, Doug when he goes and ministers in a church. Uh, the Lord sends him to a place to encourage, uh, to help, uh, to strengthen, to bless, to preach, to remind people about Jesus Christ and him crucified, but also resurrected, to, to cause them to uh, go back to their first love. And so Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send you Timothy. I don't want you to be left alone. I don't want for the people in this church that are undermining your Christian faith to have rule and reign unchecked. And so I will send your big brother Timothy. And then Paul finally gets to a place where he basically says, I don't know, I grew up in a two-story house. And sometimes if my brother and I uh, were unruly upstairs, my dad might say, don't make me come up there. <laughs> Settle down. You do, you do not want me to come up there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Paul, Paul basically says that. He basically says, uh, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. I'm coming up there. You better, you better take that into consideration. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to let you drift off. Now, I want you to think about how much love Paul would have for these people who have disregarded him as an apostle and chosen other people to follow or to be led by. And they even behind the scenes talk about him behind his back. Run him down, mock him, jeer him, just like the world. But these are church people. And I'm telling you, we probably can endure attacks and words and gossip from the world so much easier than if it's somebody in our own household or somebody in our own church. This would be hurtful and it would wound you deeply. And Paul still loves these people. It's a great kindness. It's a picture. It's a wonderful picture of how great is the love of God in Christ for you and for me of how we falter and fail regularly, of how we choose to have idols in our hearts and minds and pursue those and exalt those things over the rightful king, Jesus. And Jesus basically is saying, I am going to come up there because I love you enough. You are destroying yourself, and I have better for you than you have for yourself. Paul did go back. <laughs> he did go back. Do you know, I guarantee as he wrote those words, he was praying, Lord, at your timing, send me back through to strengthen the churches you allowed me to plant. I, th these people need you desperately and use me, if you will, to strengthen them in the things of the Lord. And then he reminds the Corinthian church in our final point uh, about what constitutes the kingdom? Verse 20 and 21. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? The Corinthian church, like so many churches, talk. A great game. Talk a great game. Make great boasts. Have powerful declarations of who they are and their 
their lineage and their history and how long they've been around and their big buildings. I've been in one, I mean, then I, this, like, the, there's a PCA church, which is a great church. It looks like a castle, you know? But if it's devoid of the power of the Holy Spirit in it, it may look good, but only to the eyes of the world. The Corinthians loved eloquent speech. They liked great orators. But as Paul is pointing out here, they have no Holy Spirit power. It's vanity. It's a chasing after the wind. It's, it's uh, empty breath, empty words. Nothing, nothing of the fruit of the Spirit is happening in the Corinthian church. And so Paul, as he begins to talk about that, he is saying you need to move away from this worldliness, these uh, accolades that you want to get from the world, and move back to what the Holy Spirit calls you to do and to be. You want to get back to look into the Holy Spirit, look into the Word of God. Lord Jesus, come in and amongst us and change and transform us. Make us like you. So that rather than setting up these divisions in the church and boasting about all the things that we have, we would be reliant upon you to bless us, to keep us. That as we suffer like the apostles, as we, as we bear the crosses that you will bring our way, that we would still, even in the midst of spiritual trial and tribulation, we would still feel full. Not based on worldliness or ego, or false self-perception, but we would feel full because your fullness is in and amongst us, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And though, though we may be called the scum of the earth and the refuse of all the world, we would still feel and know that Jesus is our king and we reign with him because he reigns forever with great power, authority, and dominion. So the Corinthian church, Paul is saying, they wanted, they wanted the crown with no cross. But Paul is also helping them see, even though the apostles are suffering terribly and traveling around and having to work with their hands and suffering uh, wind and rain and cold and mocked and jeered. And if you look at Paul's testimony, like I read to you a couple of weeks ago, Horrible things, horrible things becoming him. Stoned, beaten, whipped, run out of town, uh, kicked out of the synagogue, all of those types of things. Paul is saying you can still have the joy. It's not going to come from the world. It's going to come from Jesus Christ. You can still have it. It's not like we live dour, sour, sad, pitiful lives and saying woe is me. We're going through all these things, and the reason that we can offer, uh, uh, respond to evil with kindness is because we are full in Jesus, and we're reigning with Christ, and we're satisfied in our souls and spirit. So out of that fullness, we offer back to our um, enemies. And so it, Paul ends it with this. What do you want? What, what is it that you want, Corinthian church? It's actually a standalone question. He's just saying, what, what is it that you actually want? And then he asks another question. So he, there, you know, the first part of 24 is not a rhetorical question. He's really asking, what do you want? And then he gives this two-parter. He's, he's going to offer him uh, an option. <laughs> Shall I come to you with a rot? Um, I've never been to Catholic school or whatever, but uh, growing up you'd see these pictures of people in a Catholic school and they would have to put their hands on the desk and they, did y'all ever have this happen? And they would have their fingers hit by, by the nun or whatever. That's really the picture here. It's not, it's not a rod like uh, you're going to get caned or something. I think this was more a disciplinary action. Uh, Paul's saying, do you want me to come, since I'm the tutor, since I'm the headmaster, I'm going to come and I'm going to treat you like children who are misbehaving, and I'm going to whack you on the hand, right? 
Uh, do, you want, do you want that? Do you want to, you know, do you want that? Or, or here's another one. Would you like me to come in with love in a spirit of gentleness? And he offers him either one of those. Because is that not what a loving father does with their children? A lot of times they'll offer them options. And then you discover the heart of a child at that point. Is a child going to continue in rebellion uh, and disobedience, or are they going to respond to the love of the Father who cares for them and desires for their best and their well-being? Which do you wish? Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, um, we pray for a spirit of repentance in our own hearts. We pray for a spirit of repentance among the churches that claim your name. We pray that you would be gracious to us and empower us with your Holy Spirit, that we would truly desire to live for you, and that we would repent of our egos and our self-righteous uh, perceptions. We pray that you would humble us so much that we would find in the midst of trial and tribulation that we still have great joy. We still know that there's a victory that has been won and accomplished and it will be uh, given to us here and now in our own hearts, but also in the future life to come. And so, Lord, as we endure a cross uh, in the eyes of the world and at the hands of the world, we pray for joy. We pray for the exaltation of Jesus, and as we endure patiently with kindness and gentleness and meekness, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, that we might truly love our neighbors as we love ourselves, that they might give glory to you, our Father in heaven. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.